So I just want to start off by doing a land acknowledgement. Um, this is U of T's land acknowledgement, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, and I will just read it out. I would like to acknowledge the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates. It has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to work in the community on this territory. So, as I'm sure you anticipate, I will in my presentation unpack what I mean by this, a different shade of green. Um, really, my slides are structured to facilitate conversations, so I do hope that the conversation part of this evening will actually be longer than the presentation itself. Um, there are many things about the image that I've chosen that I feel reflects what I want to talk about this evening. And I just want to say that I really did uh, engage my group, the People's Climate Movement, to prepare for this presentation, so their contributions are also reflected in this as well. So to start off, for me it's really important to recognize the role that Indigenous people have played, not just in the territory we're on, but across the world, in advancing the concept of what we perhaps call environmentalism. This concept has been really inherent in many indigenous cultures and the way of looking at having a harmonious relationship with Mother Earth and you know using only what we need um, is really at the foundation, I believe, of what some of us have come to call environmentalism. So I feel it's not even right to embark on a journey to talk about um, environmentalism or climate change specifically, but without first acknowledging the leadership role that Indigenous people have played. So I just wanted to start off by uh, acknowledging that. So I, I couldn't resist but help sharing this image with you. So as I was beginning to prepare for this talk, I went to Google the ubiquitous purveyor of all information on the internet and I googled environmentalists and I clicked image and, and this is what came out. <laughs> and I just want to see for you, what does this invoke for you? Like somebody just shout out, what does it say to you? It's a tree hugger. Yeah. Mother Earth pregnant. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that one. Uh, Anyone else? Any other thoughts on this image? No, I'd say it's love of, of yeah. nature and all that's okay. given to us. Yeah. See, there's a heart as well formed by his yeah. thumb fingers. So that's a bit yeah, of heart too. Yeah. For me, uh, it's interesting because I, the lens I saw this w through, and I mean, I, I love moss and I love nature, but the whole sort of tree hugger concept, for me, immediately I felt alienated by it. <laughs> that was just my, I'll be honest, that was just my immediate reaction. And uh, so anyways, I just thought I would share it with you as I was talking about perhaps sort of uh, redefining what it means to be an environmentalist or what it means to be part of the climate movement. I just thought I'd share that, that that was the number one for me that popped up. And it could be just my algorithm, right? But uh, I'd be curious to see if it pops up for you. So. What is the new climate movement? So these are the things that I'm going to propose to you tonight that it is. It's diverse and interprofessional. It's intergenerational. It's inclusive and interconnected. It's justice and values based. And lastly, it's a catalyst for something bigger. So Richard has really given a great introduction. And I find this very helpful because I just want to start with my personal experience in the climate movement. And I want to acknowledge that I'm actually a newcomer to this movement, very new in fact. 
And I always had environmental concerns, but I personally did not act on them until a couple years ago, in 2014, when the People's Climate Marches were being organized. And basically how I got pulled in was that avaz.org put out a call for organizers. Um, they put out a, a call through an e-blast and there was a form and you had to kind of fill in your why you thought you would be a good organizer. And I almost didn't do it. I was, I was heading out of town and I was like, oh, this looks interesting and I've always had this kind of niggling feeling that I should be doing something but I really don't have time. And it was really at a last, I was late. I missed the deadline and then I decided to submit it anyways. And I didn't know that really at that moment it was going to change my life. Um, what had happened was, um, as Richard had said, uh, there was going to be a huge convergence in New York City. Maybe some of you were actually there at the UN, the marches leading up to the UN Summit on Climate Change. And what Avaz did, which I thought was really clever, was say, okay, we need to have sister marches around the world. It's great that we're having this huge one in, in New York City, but what about people who can't go to New York City? What about the influence we can still have on other governments? Um, and so what happened was that all the people I would say that I knew of who were extremely dedicated um, to doing activism around climate change in Toronto got on a bus and they went down to New York City or they were planning to go down to New York City and they were really focused on organizing around that. What Avaz did by putting out this call was actually create space for new people who weren't planning to go to New York City like myself um, to step up in a way and start organizing. So we got this email saying, um, here's an email list. You don't know who's on this list, but if you press the send button and send a message to all these people, um, they'll get your message. You know, start by picking a venue and call everybody there. So um, me and my other co-organizer, Peter, we set up a meeting in the Greenpeace warehouse with a bunch of people we'd never met and we had no idea who was going to show up. Um, so here we are all sitting in this circle total strangers, most people not environmental activists, people who are very concerned and maybe they're part of other movements. And yeah, none of us know each other. We're very, very culturally and professionally and age diverse. And we've got to just figure, we've got to just figure it out. And we have no resources. Um, and none of the Ingo professionals are around to help us because they've all gone down to New York. And through this process, uh, I could say that we put together this march, which had around 3,000 people on a shoestring budget. The only organization we got resources from was from Toronto 350, another volunteer-powered organization, who gave us $400. And the march was a huge success because people figured out ways to pool their experience and skill sets. You know, we had, we had communications professionals we had people that were good at marketing. We had people that had organized in other types of movements. And, you know, all this just came together. And what ended up happening afterwards was that a sort of core group of us decided that we really just liked working with one another. And we decided to form the People's Climate Movement as a way to stay together and keep doing this work. So for me, it was a very transformational experience. What I heard the most during that time was, I've never done anything like this before. And it, it helped me realize, like, you get the right combination of people that share a common value, um, and anything's possible. So after, after this experience of organizing, I thought, well, if I'm interested this, in this, I need to go out and I need to learn more because I really didn't know that much, to be perfectly honest, about climate change or environmentalism. And so I started going out to meetings held by other groups um, as a way of learning. And I, I remember going into these meetings and kind of looking around and being like, there's nobody my age in these meetings. Um, so this image kind of reflects me, I'm at the center of that. You can kind of guess what my age is because when I was in high school, I used a, an electric typewriter. Um, I didn't have a computer. That wasn't commonplace for people to have computers at that time. So I didn't use the old model typewriter, but I used an electric typewriter which had a whiteout ribbon, thank God, because I couldn't type to save my life. Um, and when I think back, you know, that, that's, that's a relic in a way. Um, but 
for me, this sort of embodies where I found myself in the climate movement because I was either at meetings with students and I was the old person in the room, or I was either at meet, or on the other hand, I was at meetings with people who were retirement age or near retirement. Um, and there was this amazing cadre of older people who were prepared to welcome me into their meetings and share their knowledge. But in either case, I wondered where the heck are the people my age? And I guess where they were was that a lot of them who were interested in the environment had professional sort of ingo jobs or, you know, they were starting young families and they just didn't feel that they had time to do activism. So it was an interesting sort of dynamic to kind of step into in a way. And that leads me to this feeling that I've had that what is so critical to our movement are in fact these intergenerational relationships. And for me, I do want to acknowledge that as I've said, I am a newcomer in this area of work and I have a lot to learn from people who have done it longer than me and I don't want to reinvent the wheel. And I think one of the challenges of people in my generation or younger is that sometimes we don't have a strong sense of history or our place in it. And I remember talking to one of my activist friends and he said, well, I like not knowing about history because I don't feel encumbered by it. <laughs> I can make decisions with a fresh perspective and I'm not weighed down by history. Now, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole right now, but I can think of a lot of things that have happened over the last five years where if we had reflected on history rather than acting on impulse, um, you know, a lot of people's lives could have been saved. I mean, I'm talking about geopolitics. So for me, I really feel that knowing our place in history, knowing what has happened is important. Though I also understand the perspective of young people of wanting to shed this and reject it somehow because in a way sometimes that impulse does allow us to evolve and move forward. Um, so we need to find that balance and I feel like having intergenerational relationships in this movement is the key to finding that balance if we can work together. And that, that element of respecting one's elders, and this is a culture that I grew up in, it facilitates knowledge transfer or, or knowledge exchange between relationship, between people of different ages and, the, and their relationships. Um, the images I put up here, um, one of them is actually me with my aunt, and she was one of the first people I knew who was involved in environmentalism, so I think she was a very positive influence in my life. And you know, what I love to see is when people bring their kids out to rallies. I think that's fantastic. That's at one of our, our rallies that we organized. And I was, at, I was at the Women's March, as I'm sure many people were a while ago. And I remember looking at this, this young family and there was a five-year-old and she was like just belting out, the people united will never be defeated. And you know, she was saying it with such conviction and I felt like she knows actually what she's saying. Like this, this experience is a formative <laughs> experience for her. So I think it's really important. And so for me, when I'm seeing less of people my age, I feel like that's a challenge to all of us. We've got to get those people out. Um, they need to become part of this, this intergenerational sandwich, which is a good thing. So a point that was raised when I talked to the People's Climate Movement folks about doing this presentation was that they wanted me to say that our movement is inclusive and interconnected. And certainly that has been my experience in our group, that the people in our group, they're not just climate focused. I mean, they're active all over the place. They are part of community organizations. Um, they're, they're doing things around food, they're doing things around labor, you know, they, they're really socially active people and because they have all these ties to other groups and other movements, it really enables us to be more effective as a group and, and I'd say there's a collective pooling of this knowledge and insight which help us not to operate in an insular kind of way. Um, one of the campaigns that we've been involved in over the last year was um, an anti-trans-Pacific partnership agreement campaign. And the way we designed our campaign, obviously we were coming at it through an environmental lens and, and looking at the big risks to you know, climate policy and environmental protection 
regulations and that kind of thing, but we also designed the campaign to look at the impact on indigenous land rights and health and um, you know employment and other things. And it was through this process of designing this campaign that we started becoming involved with other groups like trade justice groups, for example. And I think that was really beneficial for us. So I feel like this movement, the state of it now, people get that. And I see this in other groups too. They get that they are not single issue focused, that there are all these interconnections. And by you know either just showing up at other people's events, that's really the best starting point, or actually co-designing campaigns, we're gonna get a lot further um, with our own work and advancing something better. Environmental justice, I feel, over the last couple of years has really come into the language of groups that are doing environmental organizing. And I personally feel it's a very important concept because it's really reframed the climate change discourse and it's created space and recognition that people who are highly impacted um, can speak for themselves. We don't need to speak for them if we create that kind of space. And, and, and recognizing that we are all impacted but in different ways um, relative to our position in society, you know, our, where we live, our ethnicity, um, I think has really moved things forward a lot in the movement. What I think are some of the pitfalls are that sometimes the way in which we communicate this concept can actually have the opposite reaction. So um, there's a risk in saying that climate change, when we use the, the terms directly impacted, we're all directly impacted. We don't want people to feel distanced by that kind of language and say, oh, it's happening to those people over there. We really want to be mindful of the fact that we, we want to promote a message where it's happening to all of us, but due to reasons around justice and equity, it is impacting people, some people more than others, like our communities up north who are not having their ice roads freeze over. I mean, that has a huge impact on life. Um, if I look at where I work in Malawi, the impact of drought on people who are income insecure is huge. But I think how we talk about things is incredibly important. And I've heard things come out like, well, we can't talk about climate change unless we use, use the word, word justice, climate justice, environmental justice. And we sh I feel that as a movement, as activists, let's stop telling people what they can and can't say. Let's motivate them to take these terms on board and realize them rather than pointing fingers and using them as a basis to judge how how sensitive people are. Use it as an educational opportunity. So I'd say that would be one of the downsides in the way this concept has sometimes been brought into our movement. So on the topic of communication, <laughs> um, I'm not for muzzling scientists, let me just say that right now, but I think that one of the mistakes that perhaps we've made, and I've certainly made this myself as a relative newcomer to this movement, is to think people are going to buy into scientific facts because those facts are so powerful. And how could they possibly ignore what I'm trying to say to them about the kind of tipping point we're at? And I think for me, that's been definitely part of my personal learning journey that I love science and I'm engaged with it, but I shouldn't assume that that's how everybody interacts with it. And what I see, you know, and what I've proposed to you is that our movement is becoming a values-based movement. And we're starting to understand that connecting with people's values rather than hurling scientific facts at them is really the way to go. It's going to be a lot more effective. And I think this is coming in a context, you know, I think a lot of people are really alarmed by what we're seeing, obviously, in the US around fake news and, and mm -hmm. you know, Trump coming to power. And what we're seeing is that facts are going out the door. But what's not going out the door are people's values. Sometimes you know, some of these politicians that seem to come in, in an, a particular moment and they do something that connects with people's values, even if it's a negative thing, I think we need to pay attention to that. And I think we've seen that in the city too with Rob Ford, right? He, 
there was something about the way he communicated certain values, even though they weren't based on anything factual that hit a nerve with people, and we need to pay attention to that. And this is, again, something that the people in my group asked me to convey today, that we need to not sideline those people who don't agree with us, but we need to find common ground around values with them. The other thing that I'd like to introduce into this discussion is maybe we need to look at other types of science too to complement climate science. So a recent sort of step on my, my journey, which Richard had spoken about, is that I've decided to join an organization called Environmentum that was started um, by two people that I encountered in the climate movement, Vince and Peter. And what they've done is take behavioral change science, largely from addictions research, and look at how to apply it in terms of motivating people to take up environmentally sustainable behaviors. And so to me, that's a way to include science that connects with people's values. So I'll give you an example, and this is what motivated me to put up the polar bear image. So one of the exercises that Environmentum does in schools is they go through a mapping exercise with students age 14 to 18, so high school students. And they get them just to rank their, their top personal values. And these values have nothing to do with the environment or climate or anything like that. You know, do they, do they value social justice? Do they value family? A whole range of things. So once they identify what their top values are, they then map them against environmental values. And you know what comes up at the bottom of the heap is really images and ideas around the polar bear and biodiversity. That's not the thing, actually, that students associate with their personal values. It's not that they don't care about biodiversity or wildlife or that kind of thing. They don't make the mental link which I think has profound implications when we're doing campaigns to reach young people, that kind of evidence. So that is, a, to me, a useful application of science-based methods to understand, you know, how do we reach different people of different ages, of different backgrounds, when we're trying to communicate these messages. The other thing that I was personally very dismissive of two years ago was the whole ride your bike mentality. You do your part, you compost, you ride your bike, it's all about personal action. And I was like, that's a bunch of poppycock. Mm -hmm. What we need is our governments to take decisive action to set real science-based targets and create a roadmap to get there. That was my whole line and I was out there, <laughs> you know, preaching that to whomever would listen to me. And what I've come to realize a bit more is that we are actually looking at a continuum that often people who are personally motivated to start taking up behaviors and examining things for themselves will, if they continue down that path, if they stay motivated, they will be ready to take up civic action. They will be the ones that show up at those town halls or even organize those town halls. So I don't think that it's helpful to look at these things as mutually exclusive. I do think we need to be aware when politicians, like our federal politicians who are responsible for that level of policy, go out and have town halls and say, well, what can you do in your community? And that it's a diversion tactic. I think we do need to be aware of that. But at the same time, I don't think we should poo-poo the motivation behind individual actions. And I've, I'm putting it out there because I've certainly been guilty of doing that myself. So I think it's healthier to look at it as a continuum of motivation um, rather than oppositional. Um, the other thing I want to flag up too is that when we're talking about climate policy and GHG reduction, there's no space for co-creation in that. You can tell people, well, your government needs to do X, Y, and Z, but me sitting here as an individual, there's no part that I can actually play on that, in that. As a, only, I can only put pressure on my elected representative. That's a very, very limited sphere of action for people. And so for me, what I've come to realize is that we have to look at ways to motivate people by letting them do something that means something to them in their community. And I can, for me, I can't emphasize that enough. And, and that can be inclusive of those other kinds of civic or lobbying actions, but it can't stop there. It has to be a lot more. So that brings me sort of towards the end of my presentation and my own realization that what I think the climate movement is, is part of a broader 
growing movement that's going to catalyze systems redesign. What I mean by that is that this kind of growing consciousness, which comes from people understanding uh, you know, what is going on with the climate, but also what is going on in the world with other human beings, um, is that people are realizing that our current political, economic, and social systems aren't serving people and they aren't serving the planet. And so we need to look at how we re redesign these around new priorities, new values, and emerging challenges that we're facing as a society. And this is probably, in my mind, the most powerful thing that we can do. And there is so much good work out there that models new ways of doing things, whether it's around deepening participatory democracy or reorganizing our economy or you know, building you know, grassroots food systems, energy systems, etc. It's all happening there, but it's happening in pockets. And I think one thing we need to do is really start connecting those dots. I think it's incredibly important. And, it's, and by doing that, we're getting people shifting away from issues-based thinking, which is important because there's certainly a lot of issues to work on. But as somebody that has worked on issues for about 15 years, as Richard mentioned, in all these different areas, I, I woke up and I realized, like, that's not enough. I will continue to work on issues, but I've got to work across issues as well. And I also want to you know, point out that there is resistance in community building. There's a lot going on in our world in this country that is worth protesting and should be protested. And it's very easy to only be in a protest mentality, but we have to acknowledge that we, we have finite energy. And we have to make some choices about where we're going to put our energy. And so I feel like, yes, we need to pick our moments to protest, but we can't be doing that all the time. We can't be distracted constantly by Trump and every new redesign of the Muslim ban that he comes up with. We need to, we need to show solidarity with people, but we also not need to look at the broader system issue that brought somebody like Trump into power to make sure it doesn't continue to happen. And those are very different types of energy, and they take different types of skills. I think that organizing skills around protests and rallies can be transferred to community building skills. There's a lot of common ground there. But I think we also need to be really aware um, that when we come at one another as activists saying, this has to happen now, 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 it's there's going to be a vote on, on this, there's going to be a vote on that, or this has happened and that has happened, and we expect people just to drop everything that they're doing around community organizing and switch into protest mode, that that comes at a cost. And we can't all be there all the time protesting. And I also, one thing that I've been aware of, and I, I'm still thinking about how to approach it, is you know, when I look at the young generation, um, and there was one particular young activist that said this to me right before the last federal election. And I was saying, guys, you know, we also have to be ready. What if, what if Harper does get reelected? You know, we can't let that sink our ship. And he said, Harper's been in power for most of my life. If he gets elected, I'm just going to roll up my sleeves and get back to work. And I was kind of like, on the one hand, I was really, really uh, impressed by that comment. But on the other hand, I realized that this young person has been under this cloud of negative, ineffective government for most of his young life. He was, at that moment, exactly half my age. Um, and it made me start to think, OK, this generation that's been under this cloud, where they're really, they really get the government's not serving their needs as a younger generation, what skills can we equip them with to actually start building systems and building communities? Because they've grown up under a protest mindset. They've had a lot to protest, and they're really, really good at it. Most of the young people I've met who are activists are way better at organizing protests than I am, hands down, because that's the reality they know. So what other skill sets, when we look at complex human systems, do we need to start building in our younger generation? So I'm going to leave off there. Um, and I hope that we can have a really interesting discussion. I just want to um, say thank you again for the opportunity to speak to all of you. 
um, and you know, acknowledge this great series that Science for Peace has organized and also say thank you to my uh, group members from the People's Climate Movement. Um, they're a continual source of inspiration to me and they really on a week by week basis inject a lot of positivity in my life and, and keep me hopeful and keep me optimistic and motivated. So thanks very much.